Chris Mikowski of Emerging Civil War for the American Battlefield Trust. And I want to thank you for bringing us here to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Off behind me is the Chickamauga Battlefield on the far side of Missionary Ridge. We've spent some fantastic time down there with Jim Ogden and Dave Powell exploring that battlefield, uh, Dr. Anthony Hodges. And now we've come up because they've been the Union Army has been driven off that battlefield back to Chattanooga. And we're going to tell you all about that here in just a few minutes. Chris White behind the camera, thank you for the great work you're doing there. And we're going to have some special guests for us as well. But let me just give you some context for a moment because we talked about uh, in earlier videos how in the middle of 1863, uh, Rosecrans brings the Army of the Cumberland down here to Chattanooga because this is an important rail center and it's going to open up the interior of the Deep South and that big industrial complex that has been building and building and building in central Georgia, particularly around Atlanta. And that's why this area then becomes so important. And as Rosecrans brings his army down here, uh, secures this through the Tullahoma campaign, not written in letters of blood, so he's worried that, that, his, that history will forget that campaign. And now he's going to start to get a little ambitious and set his eyes toward that advance into Georgia. Of course, we know in September, as he moves down in there, he runs into Braxton Bragg, whom he has continually outmaneuvered throughout this campaign. But then Bragg gets himself a little bit of backbone and fights back. And he's going to drive Rosecrans back into Chattanooga, where he's going to find himself bottled up. Now, it's important to realize Rosecrans does, uh, does uh, successfully get the objective of the campaign, which is securing Chattanooga. And his advance into Georgia was a little bit beyond uh, his original uh, objectives. But now he finds himself holding on to the thing he has to hold on to. And maybe it's one of those things you got to be careful what you wish for because he's going to find himself trapped as Confederates advance up and they're going to occupy Missionary Ridge behind me and some of the high ground off to my left which is called Lookout Mountain. To help us understand where we're at here at Orchard Knob in Chattanooga, I'm going to bring on one of my favorite people in the whole Civil War world, my friend Will Green. Will, thanks so much for being with us. Tell us what we're looking at as we're standing here in your home city of Chattanooga. Yes, let me be the last to welcome you to the wonderful scenic city of Chattanooga. And uh, we're standing on a place called Orchard Knob. Uh, it got its name because there was a homestead and a fruit orchard here during the uh, days when the Cherokee Indians still occupied this area. Incidentally, Chattanooga was founded in 1838 once the Cherokee Indians left this area. So Chattanooga was uh, only a generation old as an American city at the time of the Civil War. This was a part of the original Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park and uh, it was the place where units of the Union Army that didn't really have a specific location to put their monuments decided to locate their monuments here. So as we walk around Orchard Knob, you will see a lot of Union monuments up here that really have nothing to do with the two significant historical events during the Chattanooga campaign that unfolded here. One of the reasons that I like coming to Orchard Knob is that it gives probably the best perspective of the terrain involved in the Chattanooga campaign that you can get anywhere else in the area. So Chris, if we can walk around a little bit, uh, we're gonna walk over here to the west side of Orchard Knob and start pointing out some things to you. Now, as we look over here, Beyond my right shoulder, you can see Lookout Mountain that Chris mentioned to you. And if uh, the camera is good enough, you might even be able to pick up a couple of the obelisk monuments that are on the shelf where the actual battle was fought. As most people don't understand when they first come to Chattanooga, the battle at Lookout Mountain on the 24th of November did not take place at the top. It took place uh, 500 feet below on what we call the Palisades. Now, a little geographical note here. The mountains around Chattanooga all have a very similar profile in that there is a hard sandstone that does not erode and that is at the top of these mountains and that's why there's usually a three to four hundred foot vertical drop from the top of the mountains 
to the area where the limestone that is more easily eroded takes over and gives you a gentle slope here. And that is very typical of all of the mountains around here. So there's Lookout Mountain. And as we walk around a little bit farther, can you make out the flagpole over here, Chris, that is marks the location of the Chattanooga National Cemetery, which does have a role not as a cemetery, but as a high, as high ground in one of the stories we're gonna talk about uh, in just a few minutes. And then as we move around here, looking out to the west, you can see the buildings of downtown Chattanooga. Now Chattanooga at the time of the Civil War was only about a mile square. Uh, it had a population of 2,500. So Chattanooga was not a big city, uh, but as Chris pointed out, a very important strategic city uh, during the Civil War. The Union Army, when it was semi-besieged, in Chattanooga had its farthest west position in the woods that you see over my right shoulder here. Uh, that is where the Union siege lines were located. There was a Union picket line that was located on the high ground on the street just in front of us here, uh, out in front of the main Union line. And then the Confederates had an advanced picket line at the first little high ground that you see on the street in front of you. Now, as we move around in this direction, we can see the other mountains that are relevant to the Chattanooga geography. In the far distance is Sand Mountain, or Raccoon Mountain, uh, as it's called uh, on the north side of, uh, of, a, of a creek. And then farther over here to the west and north is Walden's Ridge, over which the Union Army came when it first came into Chattanooga, uh, portions of it. Uh, it is a 74 mile long ridge. At these, these, you know, we call these mountains, but they're really ridges. Lookout Mountain is 86 miles long. And it varies in width. These, all these mountains vary in width. In some places, uh, there, it's very narrow, and in other places it can be 8 to 10 miles wide. And that's the case at Walden's Ridge. If you see, I don't know if the camera can pick up the cell tower in the distance and the two blue uh, water tanks up there, but that is the location of Casa de Will. <laughs> All right, now, as we look over here to my left, you can see some white industrial buildings. Uh, you can't see the Tennessee River from here, but that is more or less the point where General Sherman's forces built their pontoon bridges to cross the Tennessee River prior to the attack on Missionary Ridge. And obviously, the real reason that we're here is the high ground in the distance, which is Missionary Ridge, uh, defended by the Confederates, uh, with a, an isolated hill over to the left here that is known as Billy Goat Hill, which from the, per the perspective of the Federals on the north side of the river, look like the northern end of Missionary Ridge. But as General Sherman would find out to his chagrin, it was an isolated hill separated by a deep ravine and 300 yards from the actual northern end of Missionary Ridge, which was called Tunnel Hill. So that's kind of where we are. Uh, this was, this Orchard Knob was a portion of the advanced main Confederate picket line. And uh, prior to the action that we'll talk about here in a minute, on November the 23rd, it was defended by a single regiment, about 300 men, from Arthur Manigault's brigade, the 24th Alabama Infantry was up here with some, some earthworks built at the base of the hill, but this was just a, basically a part of a picket line that connected the Confederate right across the high ground, across where that National Cemetery is today. There was another Alabama regiment over there. And then the picket line continued all the way over to Lookout Mountain, where the Confederates actually had uh, forces uh, uh, deployed there as well. And I want to just kind of 
follow up on something you said when you talk about Lookout Mountain. It's a great spot to stand there and you can see the terrain that Will has described. And one of the things that always amazes me is that as you stand there and look out over these long ridge lines that you've talked about, and it's almost like they all have flat tops, like nature has just come and scraped off the top of them. And, and it looks very maze-like as you look across that terrain. And that's really what the Union Army had to get through in order to get to Chattanooga in the first place. And so most people think of Lookout Mountain as having this great vista, which it does. But as you and I were talking before we started, Orchard Knob is really the place to come if you want to get a real sense of the topography and the geography that took place uh, for our story. Well, you have a 360 degree view from up here. You can look to the west, you can look to the east, you can look to the north and look over here to the south. Uh, is, this is a part of the National Military Park. It's about one square city block uh, located on the, on a, a neighborhood on the east side of Chattanooga. Uh, and uh, as our, my friend Dave Powell and I were talking about, we've been coming here for many, many years, this used to be kind of a rough spot. I mean, you would find lots of litter up here, occasionally some vagrant type person uh, sleeping in this Illinois monument here and it dissuaded people from coming up here. They felt uncomfortable in this environment. But the local neighborhood here, primarily an African-American neighborhood, decided they didn't want to see that kind of uh, environment at Orchard Knob and they took it on themselves to kind of police this area, clean it up, and today, as you can see, not a speck of litter. We didn't go around and pick up litter in order to make this a nice spot. And so this kind of a success story about how uh, a neighborhood can adopt an historic site and make it a place that you want to come. Now, I'm going to bring Dave Powell on here for a second, since we'll mention him, because um, we got to get our story to this spot. We've talked about the federal retreat out of Chickamauga. Now they're kind of cooped in. And as Will mentioned, it's a semi-besieged army. And one of the popular misconceptions of the Battle of Chattanooga is that Rosecrans is bottled up in Chattanooga. He's completely cut off. Everyone's starving to death. And there's some truth to that. But some of those stories become so exaggerated that folks in Washington decide there needs to be a change of command. And to talk a little bit about that, I want to ask Dave to come in and tell us about who the new sheriff's going to be in town. The, the defeat at Chickamauga produced something of a panic reaction in Washington, D.C. Uh, it had been a summer of success. Everybody was riding a, a wave of victory, especially uh, General Ulysses S. Grant, who forced the surrender of the Confederate Army at Vicksburg. But then Grant uh, remained inactive for almost two months after Vicksburg. The, the federal government didn't decide what to do with him. And then Chickamauga happens and disaster, and suddenly Rosecrans appears to be penned up in Chattanooga. No one has quite a firm grasp of how serious the situation is in Washington, D.C. And so uh, uh, Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton gets on a special train and he orders Grant to meet him. And they meet in Indianapolis and they're on their way to Louisville. And Stanton has come with two sets of orders in his pocket. The first set is uh, an order creating a brand new department, uh, uh, well, a division called the Military Division of the Mississippi. And it combines three departments, the uh, Department of the Cumberland, which is headed by William Stark Rosecrans, the Department of the Ohio, which is headed by Ambrose Burnside, and Grant's own department, which will now be headed by William T. Sherman. Um, and th that order uh, creates, leaves those commands intact and creates this new overall commander in Grant. The second order does the exact same thing with one critical difference. It replaces William Stark Rosecrans with George Thomas. Now, Rosecrans and uh, Stanton have had a difficult relationship through the summer, uh, through the spring and summer of 1863. Uh, Rosecrans has somewhat of a political deaf ear. Uh, he's uh, uh, always, he's constantly demanding things from the War Department that the War Department can't necessarily provide. And so by uh, the defeat, by the time of the defeat at Chickamauga, uh, the this relationship between uh, Stanton uh, and Rosecrans has soured dramatically. And Rosecrans, uh, I really think Rosecrans hands those two sets of orders to General Grant, but it's, well, General Grant, you can keep General Rosecrans or you can replace him. <laughs> and Grant, who has a much better political sense, immediately accepts the orders replacing General Rosecrans. Those orders are issued on October 19th. 
they're telegraphed. There is still a, a tenuous telegraph line and signal line here into Chattanooga. They're telegraphed uh, to Rosecrans, and he receives them uh, on the 20th. Uh, and then Grant uh, and Rosecrans meet briefly in Bridgeport, Alabama, or in Stevenson, Alabama, on the 21st. And then Grant makes his way over Walden Ridge, arriving on the night of October 23rd, uh, to meet with the new commander of the Department of the Cumberland, the Army of the Cumberland, George Henry Thomas. So I want to bring Will back in here because when George, uh, excuse me, when, when Grant shows up, um, are things as bad as he's led to believe? Is Rosecrans really desperately starved? Is his army in a terrible spot? Well, I don't know desperately, but yes, uh, the Federal Army was down to first half rations and then quarter rations. The only way that they could get supplies into Chattanooga was from the bridgehead uh, at the end of the railroad line at Bridgeport, and then to wagon those supplies 60 miles up the Sequatchie Valley, and then over this torturous road on Walden's Ridge, uh, which the modern road today uh, is much improved from the wartime road, but it's still so scary that lots of people in Chattanooga won't even drive it. Uh, so yeah, there were some supplies coming in, but yes, it was desperate. But what happens next is that Grant consults with William Farrar Smith, who had become the chief engineer of the Department of the Cumberland. And Smith had developed, along with Rosecrans, frankly, a plan to expedite the supplies coming in to Chattanooga. Uh, this would be the famous cracker line, as it would be known. And without uh, seeing a map, it's kind of difficult to understand what would happen, but essentially, uh, the Union Army would create a link across the Tennessee River at a place called Brown's Ferry. Uh, an action on the 27th of October uh, made that possible, and now the supplies coming into Chattanooga were more than sufficient to sustain the Army. This is just Will's opinion, but once that supply line, the Cracker Line, had been established, you kind of wonder what Braxton Bragg was thinking about staying here. Uh, he was not interested in attacking the Federals in Chattanooga. His scheme, apparently, was to starve them out of Chattanooga. Well, now that strategy was moot. So as just an aside, you kind of wonder at this point, what, what is Bragg's point in arraying his troops from Missionary Ridge to the east all the way across to Lookout Mountain to the west when the reason for doing that was no longer valid. Well, Grant is building up his, his strength here um, and while Bragg is diminishing his strength. Uh, everyone knows about the dysfunction of the Army of Tennessee at its highest level. James Longstreet, who had come down here and played an important role in the victory at Chickamauga, remained a thorn in Bragg's side as were most of the high-ranking officers in the Army of Tennessee. Longstreet had too much of a cachet to just demote or send away to someplace else, fire him. Bragg knew he couldn't do that. But he came up with the idea that, I know how to get rid of this pain in the neck, Longstreet. We'll send him up into Upper East Tennessee and uh, with the idea of rousting out Ambrose Burnside uh, who was there be, uh, just south of Knoxville. So I think it was around November the 5th or so, Longstreet departs for Upper East Tennessee. Well, of course, Bragg's army is diminished by 15,000 troops. What's Grant doing? Grant is making his army bigger. And who does he call upon? His favorite boy, William Tecumseh Sherman, with portions of the 15th Corps and the 17th Corps Sherman marches across from Mississippi through North Alabama and arrives here uh, in uh, November, mid-November of 1863. And this, his arrival triggers Grant's plan to wipe out the Confederate Army up here and send them someplace else. And I know that Longstreet's move is, is somewhat problematic in that uh, some of the Confederate prisoners that get captured 
misinterpret Longstreet's movement as a general withdrawal on Bragg's part. So Grant starts to get intelligence from some of these prisoners saying like, ooh, the Confederates are pulling out, which then puts Grant in a mindset like, ooh, there's an opportunity here for me to strike. Well, and that's really kind of a great, a great segue into the first of two military stories that are best told here on Orchard Knob. As, as Chris points out, Sherman uh, is on the north side of the river, and Grant's plan is to send Sherman across the river, uh, near where those white buildings are that we pointed out earlier, and then ascend the north end of Missionary Ridge. In the meantime, General Hooker would go across the base of Lookout Mountain and then ascend the south end of the Confederate defenses on Missionary Ridge at a place called Rossville Gap. Thomas's uh, army of the Cumberland, Grant probably trusted them least of all. Well, and that makes some sense. Wait, First, wait, I gotta stop yeah. it. I gotta. Someone trusts Joe Hooker? <laughs> well, <laughs> only because he's so easy to harass, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Hooker, uh, uh, Grant didn't know much about Hooker, but, uh, uh, but Hooker was ambitious to restore his reputation from his defeat at Chancellorsville and would be the secondary, he would be the secondary uh, source of the victory here. Sh Sherman, well, I mean, this was Grant's old army. Of course, he's gonna, he's gonna think that they're the best. Now, and Thomas's army, what was the most recent experience of Thomas's army? Wow. Terrible defeat at, at Chickamauga. So consequently, Grant sort of put Thomas's role as a support role, that once Sherman was moving south from the north end of the ridge, and once Hooker was moving north from the south end of the ridge, then Thomas here in the middle could make an assault in support of these two flanking movements on Missionary Ridge. Uh, now, as Chris pointed out, you know, Longstreet is taking off towards uh, Knoxville, and Sherman's presence on the north side of the river is detected by the Confederates on Missionary Ridge. So Bragg thinks, oh my God, here's a whole bunch of Yankees over there on the north side. I'll bet they're going after Longstreet come up in his rear. So Bragg tells Pat Claiborne and a division under a fellow named Bushrod Rust Johnson to leave their positions on Missionary Ridge and go north uh, in pursuit of this potential Union reinforcement against Longstreet. Well, Grant it becomes aware of this movement of Confederate forces heading off of Missionary Ridge to the north. And he wonders if this is the precursor to an entire evacuation of Missionary Ridge by the Confederates. And consequently, he tells Thomas to launch a reconnaissance in force towards Missionary Ridge just to determine whether or not the Confederates were really still up there in strength. And this leads to our first uh, real combat situation here at Missionary Ridge on November the, on Orchard Knob rather, on November the 23rd. Now Thomas is over here at the edge of the Union uh, position in Chattanooga and he decides that he's going to array most of his army, 20, 25,000 men on the edge of the defenses uh, as if they are going to conduct a, like a dress parade which had been done in the past. I mean, that's not all that unusual. And the Confederates up here on Orchard Knob, the 24th Alabama, is looking over here almost a mile to their west and thinking, oh, well, this is kind of a show. Uh, well, we'll watch all of this. But then about 1.30 in the afternoon on November 23rd, a signal gun is fired and most, uh, so many of these federal troops begin marching across towards Archer Knob. Well, that must have been one of those OG moments for the 24th Alabama. And Thomas Wood's division of the 4th Corps was given the lead. And here at Orchard Knob, uh, the Union Army's best communist, August Villick, uh, his brigade uh, was focused on capturing Orchard Knob. 
and there really wasn't a whole lot of combat here. The Alabama boys fired one to three volleys at this huge volume of federal blue uniforms coming at them, and they do the logical thing, and they get the hell out of here and retreat back up on Missionary Ridge at a loss of about 175 men. Uh, the same thing happens over at uh, what is now the National Cemetery, another portion of this Confederate picket line. Uh, William Hazen's brigade uh, attacks that position, uh, the 28th Alabama, similar result. And in a matter of really just a, sh a few minutes, the Federals have secured this high ground at Orchard Knob. And this, of course, gives them a wonderful view of Missionary Ridge. And it also, one of the shortages the Federal Army was suffering under was a lack of firewood. Uh, and this brought in some of the woodlots between Orchard Knob and the Union position in uh, Chattanooga. So it alleviated a firewood problem. Now, Thomas had uh, completely uh, accomplished his mission. There was no pursuit up to Missionary Ridge. They occupied this position about a, a, a mile in advance of what the old Union line was. Now, on the 24th, I, have you all talked about the Battle of Lookout Mountain? No, no, we've, uh, we've, we've basically been sticking to south of the state line. And so we've kind of, we've come up here and we're really trying to get things situated. So here's a great opportunity well, for you just to tell real, us Well, just okay, real briefly, Chris, the, the Battle of Lookout Mountain uh, is uh, the battle above the clouds. Joe Hooker is anxious to actually fight rather than just sort of bypass the, the position at Lookout Mountain. Uh, he does so, uh, a, a remarkable accomplishment logistically to get up on Lookout Mountain. I don't know, Dave, have you ever walked up the mountain the way the Federals did? No. I, Jim Ogden talked me into doing that about four <laughs> years ago. Now, we are in hiking boots. We have no equipment, no gear, no, no rifle with us. And I'm telling you, my legs were shaken for three days after that. An incredible logistical movement by John White Geary's division and uh, supported by other troops to go up the side of the mountain around the west side of Lookout Mountain and then like a giant squeegee the Union Army with its left flank at the base of the mountain its right flank at the Palisades sweeps around towards the Confederate position and in uh, dripping rain and in a uh, clouds and in horrible weather conditions the uh, Confederates who are grossly outnumbered retreat back and eventually that night will evacuate Lookout Mountain and join their comrades here on Missionary Ridge. So now the stage is set for the coup de grace and Sherman has crossed the river and on the 24th he has climbed up onto what he thinks is the north end of Missionary Ridge and he looks across and oh my gosh there's a huge ravine between where he is and the actual north end of missionary ridge let me let, let's swing over here for just a second we've got a great view here past the sign and will talked about this mistaken identity of billy goat hill which we can see off in the distance to my right and then Sherman thinking he's hitting the southern end of the Confederate line, and in fact, there's 300 yards between that and the actual Confederate position. So it's one of those, um, uh, gosh moments. <laughs> well, and Sherman doesn't really uh, do much aggressively that day to uh, rectify uh, the misunderstanding, uh, and the Confederate defense uh, up on uh, the real north end of Missionary Ridge called Tunnel Hill because there was a, a railroad tunnel underneath it was orchestrated by Pat Claiborne, uh, clearly the finest division commander in the Army of Tennessee. So, the big day is going to be November 25th. Grant and Thomas have moved up to this very spot. As Dave said earlier, this is a place where you can stand in the footsteps of so many of these important Union officers here. They had a great view of Missionary Ridge from here. And again, the plan was Sherman would move drive the Confederates to the south. Hooker, who had now conquered Lookout Mountain, would come across the Chattanooga Valley, ascend Missionary Ridge at Rossville Gap, and move northward. And while these two pincers were driving the Confederates away, at some point then, Grant would tell Thomas to attack in the center 
of the Confederate defenses. Long story short, at probably the best place to interpret the battle of, the actual battle of Missionary Ridge at, at the Sherman Reservation, ironically, uh, if you need an example of how the winners write history, Sherman suffers a terrible defeat at Tunnel Hill, but the preserved land up there is called the Sherman Reservation. It ought to be the Claiborne Reservation, actually. But Sherman fails. Hooker is delayed in crossing the Chattanooga Valley. There's our bridges are out on Chattanooga Creek. It takes him more time than Grant had expected for him to get into position. And so things aren't going very well for Grant and the uh, Union Army here on the 25th. Now, here comes a real debatable situation. There are no fewer than eight different accounts of what happens to trigger Thomas's attack. The standard story is that Grant sees Confederate troops moving to the north to reinforce the Confederates who are fighting Sherman. And so in order to mitigate that and, and, and favor Sherman, Grant will order Thomas to make an attack to the base of Missionary Ridge and await further orders. As the story goes, Thomas orders those four divisions of his army to go across the intervening ground, which is today laced with houses, but then was a mixture of woods and fields, gets to the base of Missionary Ridge, and then as Thomas and Grant are looking at the situation, the Union soldiers begin ascending the ridge. And Grant allegedly says to Thomas, who ordered those men to go up? And Thomas allegedly says, I certainly didn't, but once those boys get going, all hell can't stop them. And, and spontaneously, these Union forces go up the ridge and drive the Confederates away, uh, and the battle is won. I don't know that we'll ever really know what happened up here. I, if, and if Dave and Chris have different opinions, they certainly can voice them. My sense of the situation was that Grant did order the men to go to the base of the mountain, uh, base of the ridge, and when they got there, some of those field officers told their men to keep going. Others of the field officers told their men to stop. Some of the field officers told their men to fall back because they were getting fire from the top of the mountain up here. It was not a great place to stop. I mean, you were under fire from the top of the ridge, and so sitting there and waiting to be shot was not such a great idea. My opinion is that there was a mixture, that certainly some of the officers said, hey, don't stop here, let's keep going. I'm sure some of the units went up spontaneously, realizing them that this was a death trap and they needed to either get out or go up. Uh, but uh, the, the bottom line is, no matter how it unfolded, it was Thomas's army, ironically, that wins the battle of Missionary Ridge and uh, drives the Confederates back uh, towards their next stopping point at Dalton, Georgia. And, uh, well, you can talk about this a little bit because, you know, I think it's a fortuitous thing that the Army does go up the hill because as long as Bragg had occupied this position, he didn't do much to fortify the top of that ridge. So once the, the Federals begin that ascent, um, there's not a lot of rallying opportunity for the Confederates on top of the ridge. Well, as, uh, as the, most accounts will tell you, there were three positions that the Confederates occupied on Missionary Ridge, a, a line at the base of the, of the ridge, a line about midway up the ridge, and then a line at the top. Um, now, that wasn't necessarily a great plan, because if the guys at the bottom have to move up, you, the fellows in the middle at the top have to wait until those fellows clear the field. So that's not such a great idea. Uh, the other problem, uh, and Chris is, is definitely right about this, is that although Bragg is up here for weeks and weeks, months actually, he doesn't really fortify the position very well. Uh, there are not supporting lines of fire from our, his artillery positions. Well, that's partly a function of the geography up here. Because this is, Missionary Ridge is not just a one flat ridge. There's dips and hollows and defilade and all sorts of wrinkles on the ground. And it's pretty narrow. The problem, just like at places like Vicksburg and other places in the Civil War, you know, you're on high ground and you've got the, all those advantages, but if you are breached anywhere, there's no fallback position. 
I mean, once you're on Missionary Ridge and you, you're breached, the only place you can stop is somewhere beyond the base of the mountain. There's no fallback position. That was one of Bragg's problems. And, but he, you're right, Chris, he, he didn't really develop his strongest position. He didn't have mobile reserves that could go to one place or the other. Uh, and I think, you know, people say, well, why? Bragg wasn't incompetent. Why would he do this? I don't know. I think he was spending so much time worrying about the dysfunction in his high command that that sort of arrested his attention. But the bottom line is the Battle of Missionary Ridge is a Union victory, and there will be a pursuit by Hooker's portion of the Army uh, that will result in another, another battle two days later at a place called Ringgold Gap, which we'll be talking about in another segment. So come up here to Orchard Knob. You've got a great view of the whole surrounding area. You get a really good understanding and overview of the battle. As we were walking up here, Chris White, who's been doing great camera work for us today, said you can't really appreciate how steep the sides of this hill are until you are on it. And indeed, it's a pretty good drop off on all sides here. Uh, and that also, I think, helps you better understand some of the topography on Missionary Ridge, which has been lost to development. And that, of course, is why battlefield preservation is so important and why you your support of what we're doing is so important. So I'm going to do the quick little handoff to Chris and he's going to wrap things up for us. Uh, thanks Chris. I actually want to point off in this direction over here towards Lookout Mountain and uh, just to let you members know of the American Battlefield Trust some of the things we're doing here at Chattanooga. We're only scraping the surface of the story of Chattanooga. But on the far side of Lookout Mountain, we've actually done a, a lot of work recently to help preserve land in this area. Um, down along the, the river, down along the um, riverbanks, there's a great place called Brown's Ferry. Uh, that is gonna help open up the Cracker Line. That's a place where we actually have a, a Union Riverine landing and you're gonna see uh, troops like Evander Laws, Alabama Brigade for you Gettysburg fans fighting over in that vicinity as well as a place called Wahatchee uh, over in the uh, Wahatchee Valley over in that area of Lookout Valley uh, you'll start to see a battle that, that takes place at night and that's where John White Gary the division commander uh, in the Union 12th Army Corps transferred from the east comes out here he'll lose his son there's a very touching um, remembrance of him standing over his son Edward's body part of Knapp's Battery E 1st Pennsylvania Light Artillery and in fact Knapp's Battery has their monument to their actions here on Orchard Knob, even though they were fighting on a different part of the battlefield. Because as uh, Will pointed out, this is a, a reservation, and this is where we'll have a hodgepodge of different monuments up here. Um, we have the Illinois Monument, uh, which has all kinds of different iconography on the side of it. We have the 14th Corps symbol, 4th Corps symbol, you'll even see the 20th Corps symbol on there. Um, we have over here our State of Maryland Monument, uh, and on the top of it, if Chris po points up there, I'll give you a little, uh, a little challenge if you're watching this. If you go to uh, Gettysburg and you go to a place called uh, Oak Ridge, you might see that same Union soldier standing on a uh, uh, monument to a Massachusetts unit. So go f uh, find out which unit that is and go over to Oak Ridge uh, at Gettysburg to find that out. But if you come out here to, to uh, Orchard Knob, you get a really great sense of what the perspective of this battle was. And of course, you can stand in the footsteps uh, of some of the most famous generals on the Union side. So that's all what battlefield interpretation and preservation is all about. And it'll also show you, give you a good glimpse of why we try to preserve these uh, battlefields uh, because as Will pointed out this is one city block of a massive battlefield that's all that's left of this battlefield at least in this sector and if you go up along Missionary Ridge you can go to the various reservations as they call them here in Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park um, some of the the plaques you'll see the War Department plaques will write in people's front yards as our cannon um, so as you go up along Missionary Ridge uh, it's really an experience but we're not heading up to Lookout Mountain you can check out some videos that we shot here a few years ago over in Chattanooga National Cemetery and up at Point Park and along Craven's house which is on the top and then down on that Palisades of Lookout Mountain um, and that'll give you a, a better perspective and if you get a chance come out here to Orchard Knob check out these monuments they all tell you a story but not all these units were up here on Orchard Knob some of them weren't even within miles of Orchard Knob uh, but this is a really great place to come up here and to uh, visit the battlefield uh, on behalf of the American Battlefield Trust I want to thank Will Green Dave Powell Chris Mikowski in front of and behind the camera I'm Chris White and we encourage you to come out here if you get a chance to to Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park check out 
all the great sites here at the first national military park in the United States, um, established in 1890, and you can see some of the great work the members of the American Battlefield Trust is doing even to this day, and we even have some more things coming your way, uh, some more preservation opportunities down the road here at Chattanooga. Thanks for watching, and thanks for supporting Battlefield Preservation.